good morning and a warm welcome to everybody in the room. I have the great privilege of welcoming to the NATO Engages stage Canada's Dream Team, led by Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who... <laughs> who is joined by Foreign Minister Freeland and Defense Minister Sajjan. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Now, we know that Canada has participated in every NATO operation since the founding of the Alliance almost 70 years ago. I followed with interest your visit to Latvia yesterday where you announced that Canada would be contributing additional troops and also extending the stay of those troops in Latvia for another four years until 2023 as part of NATO's mission to deter potential Russian aggression. The success of NATO rests both on shared interests, but also very importantly on our belief in common values. And I'd love to ask you to start by sharing with all of us your view of why NATO is vital to Canada's security and why you see the alliance as relevant to our 21st century challenges. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Karen. And thank you for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to, uh, to engage this morning. Um, <clears throat> I think we have to remember a little bit why and how NATO came into being. NATO exists and existed because the great democracies had uh, just uh, countered communism and fascism uh, and it remained as a, or was an ongoing existence of pushing back against communism. Uh, but it's about enhancing and protecting the democratic principles that we all uh, hold as our core values. And that is something that continues to be as relevant as it ever has been. Uh, how we uh, help burgeoning democracies like Latvia, I mean, as you mentioned, I was there yesterday, and it was extraordinary to see uh, how, uh, one of the things we don't talk enough about NATO is what happens when diversity of voices from within NATO come together. I mean, the battle group that Canada is leading for Operation uh, Reassurance for the Enhanced Forward Presence uh, ha is the most diverse in terms of, uh, of nations. There's about seven or eight different nations coming together and not just uh, you know, side by side, but integrated with each other. And the learning that we do and the, and the, and the opportunity uh, to uh, grow together and reinforce those shared values in a way that is tangible and real while uh, supporting the Baltic states uh, is an extraordinarily important thing beyond just the military combat capacities. Uh, it's about remembering that we stand together in very important ways. Uh, and as you say, we were glad to extend uh, our mission for another four years to continue with Canada's leadership on this. Uh, and that actually brings me to another announcement uh, that Canada is proud to be making. Uh, we are going to be uh, looking with great interest this afternoon as NATO announces uh, that we are uh, going to engage in Iraq as an alliance, uh, capacity building, uh, training, uh, that next step in the challenge in Iraq, which was first defeating Daesh, and now we have to rebuild that democracy and strengthen it. NATO is going to take a significant role in that, and Canada is going to commit uh, 250 troops, a number of helicopters, and we're actually offering to command that mission for the first year. Uh, this is something that we believe in deeply. And your question, Karen, was about, you know, how does this matter for Canada's security? Well, Canada knows uh, that uh, a peaceful world, a more resilient world, a more democratic world is good for Canada and it's good for all of us. And that's why we believe so deeply in NATO. That's why we stand so strongly with the Transatlantic Alliance. And we'll continue to step up uh, everywhere we can. Uh, as you said, we've been in every mission, not because uh, of any other reason than we believe deeply in uh, the values that we're putting forward. And we know that NATO is as necessary now as it was in the height of the Cold War. It's as necessary now to promote uh, the peace, security, and strength of our true democracies and those democratic principles, which are 
under threat everywhere around the world, it seems. Uh, this is a moment for us to stand together and understand that the perspective uh, that we fight for and stand for uh, is essential today and tomorrow. Well, thank you so much for making news here in this tent with the announcement about Iraq. That's, that's really terrific news and, and for that inspiring endorsement of the alliance. And um, Minister Freeland, I noticed that last month you received Foreign Policy's Diplomat of the Year Award, so congratulations. And I read... That would be a surprise to my husband and children, <laughs> but... <laughs> No, it's wonderful. And I read with interest the speech you gave there. And you focused on a key challenge that we're facing, which the Prime Minister also just referenced. And I want to quote you. You talked about the weakening of the rules-based international order and the threat that resurgent authoritarian, authoritarianism poses to liberal democracy itself. And after the speech, you were talking with reporters and you said, I believe very strongly that it's important for those of us who believe in liberal democracy to strike back. As you know, there are concerns about rising a liberalism in NATO countries. And just to follow up on the prime minister's remarks, NATO is an alliance that's based on shared values. So if Canada is committed to the rules-based order, how does NATO fit into that frame? Well, Canada is, there's nothing conditional about it, Karen. Canada is 100% committed to the international rules-based order. And not just because it sounds good in a room like this, but because we need that international rules-based order to survive and thrive in a really big world. You know, Canada is, um, a big country geographically. We're the 10th largest economy in the world, but there's only 36 million Canadians. And we understand very profoundly that that framework of a rules-based international order is essential for us. Um, on the point about liberal democracy, Karen, um, and the Prime Minister has already addressed it, I think it is important. It is important for those of us who believe in liberal democracy, and I hope that's everybody in this room, to be proud of that and, you know, to understand that, yes, you know, populism, nativism even, authoritarianism, they are resurgent in very many parts of the world, even in countries that had seemed to be successful democracies. Some of them seem to be moving backwards. And I think those of us who believe in liberal democracy have to talk about why, our, why we hold our values, why our values work. And I think it is absolutely relevant to the NATO discussion. You know, for me, I was, I was thinking about it on the way here, and as the Prime Minister said, we were in Latvia. You know, in a way, the NATO discussion shouldn't happen principally in a room like this or even in a meeting of our leaders. NATO is not chiefly an alliance of heads of state. NATO is an alliance of all the citizens of all of our countries who are collectively pledged to support each other. NATO really has to start at home if it is going to be an alliance that has legitimacy moving forward. And, you know, NATO, these kinds of conversations should be the kinds of conversations that we have, and, and I do have them. We celebrated Canada Day uh, just over a week ago, and at the barbecue in my neighborhood, in my constituency, believe it or not, a lot of people were talking to me about NATO and the rules-based order. And, you know, the Prime Minister talked about how we've just come from Latvia, where we visited the Canadian women and men in uniform in Latvia serving in enhanced forward presence. And I have to tell you, like people, think tankers here, you'll remember a few years ago, the big question was, how does NATO remain relevant? Remember all those papers people wrote about that? How does it remain relevant in the 21st century? I can tell you, in Latvia, it is extremely clear to people the relevance of NATO. That is not an abstract philosophical question. And probably the best conversation I had was with a former comrade at arms of Harjes who served with our Minister of Defense when he was serving in Afghanistan. And she's an amazing Canadian woman. Uh, she was just finishing a six-month rotation in Latvia. 
Uh, she, we talked about her family. She had a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And that's hard, right? She's been away from her kids for six months. And I asked her how she explains to her kids what she's doing and why she has to be away for so long. And she said, I told my kids that there's a big bully who is threatening our friends. Russia is threatening our friends. And I explained to them that I tell them that in the schoolyard they have to stand up for their friends if their friends face a bully. And I said, that's what your mom is doing. Your mom is standing up for Canada's friends. And I think that's a beautiful explanation. And we have to make clear to real, regular people, not that any of us are androids, but to people who don't <laughs> spend their days thinking about NATO, why this really matters. But I do love this idea of NATO barbecues, right? If everyone in this room starts having barbecues where we talk about NATO, that could have a big public diplomacy impact. But, uh, Minister Sajan, I, we've hit on some core principles of why NATO matters. But in all likelihood, this NATO summit will focus on burden sharing. And that's because the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has focused so particularly on the issue of progress that NATO member states who are not yet spending 2% of their GDP on defense, when will they get there? And it reportedly, though Canada is of course increasing its defense spending, it isn't at 2%, and reportedly Canada received a letter from President Trump that was quite sharply worded. Canada wasn't alone in that. Many other NATO countries received a similar letter where Canada was criticized for not spending enough on its own defense and warning that Americans are losing patience with Canada's failure to share NATO's collective security burden. And I would very much appreciate hearing your perspective on this subject. No, thank you, Karen. And uh, uh, first of all, I just want to give a, uh, a shout out to all our NATO troops who are doing tremendous work on our behalf of our countries ar around the world. And we were just able to uh, meet not only our Canadian Armed Forces members, but uh, many of the uh, uh, many nations who are taking part of uh, the battle group in Latvia and how how well they're working together. And it sends a tremendous message of interoperability and unity and of, de uh, of deterrence. And we are facing challenges ar ar um, around the world um, to our uh, threats to uh, a rules-based order, whether it's from a counterterrorism perspective, whether it's Daesh, the migrant crisis. And because of those challenges, NATO is also stepping up, and hence the reason why uh, many of our nations are, um, have done our assessments on what, how, do, how are we going to contribute. And, um, uh, and the Prime Minister gave me a very uh, strong mandate to conduct a very thorough defense policy review so that we can determine what is needed for Canada and how Canada is going to contribute. And there's a reason why our defense policy now is called strong at home, secure in North America, and engaged in the world. Because we also have to make sure that we um, uh, look after our, our citizens, our North American defense, uh, with our very important ally, the US, uh, as part of our uh, very unique command of uh, the binational command, which is NORAD, uh, so that we're secure in North America, but also we're engaging in the world. And, uh, and Canada will always uh, do its part. Uh, we've been part of every, uh, every mission. But to, to making sure that we have the right capability. So we went through a very thorough assessment, not only talking to experts but allies, but more importantly, talking to Canadians. And it is very relevant to Canadians, the importance of NATO. And there's a very strong message from Canadians of Canada playing its part. But Canada also needs to play its part in a meaningful role. It can't be just a check in the box. All of us coming together, as uh, Christia said, this is about uh, uh, countries uh, coming together, bringing our collective experience, and that's what we are doing. So when we talk about uh, um, uh, the enhanced force presence, this is about na nations that are coming together, but making sure we have the right capability to support one another. And in Canada's role uh, here, we are making a very significant contribution into our defense, uh, a 70% increase um, uh, in, in the next uh, 10 years, which is going to modernize all our three uh, services, uh, including our special forces, but more importantly, not only uh, the role so that they can play, it's making sure that our women and men in our forces can actually make that meaningful contribution. And we are seeing that. 
So whether it's um, whether it's uh, in Europe, whether it's our uh, naval task force.